and welcome to In Search of Insight, Nootropics Depot's monthly podcast. I'm your host, Erica, and sitting next to me is our product specialist, Emil. Hey, everyone. This month, we are talking about the world's most expensive spice, saffron. We're going to be discussing our extract, and we're also going to be discussing how saffron can benefit our mood, our energy levels, our cardiovascular health, our sleep quality, inflammation, and oxidation, and many, many more benefits from this very precious spice. So before we get into all of those technical details, we're going to talk a little bit about the traditional uses and origins of saffron, where it's grown, how it's processed, and what makes it so expensive and precious. And we're going to get a very, very deep dive into all of its benefits and how it's been used over many years by people um, all over the world. But before we do that, let's get into the first segment of the podcast, which is new product releases. So every month in the In Search of Insight podcast, we revisit the new products that have been released since our last podcast episode dropped. And this month, we have three new products to discuss with you. The first one is the Red Rishi Ultra Concentrated 9% Ganoderic Acid Extract Capsules. Now, for those of you who are mushroom heads, you already know about the benefits of red reishi, but let's give Emil a chance to basically set the stage and tell us what's special about these capsules and what makes this 9% ganoderic acid extract different from other red reishi products that we carry and other red reishi products that are on the market. Yeah, this is a really interesting product and it took us a really long time to find. Uh, so one of the main bioactive compounds in red reishi or the scientific name is Ganoderma lucidum, is ganoderic acids. We also have beta-glucans and a bunch of different polysaccharides and some other terpene compounds, but the ganoderic acids, which are triterpenoids, are often seen as some of the most highly active compounds within reishi. So we found it strange that you can't really find reishi extracts that have a high amount of ganoderic acid. The highest we had ever found was 2%, which, to be honest, 2% is already quite high, but we wanted a little bit of a higher standardization. One of the benefits for this is when you go up in standardization, you are basically deleting other compounds and focusing on a sp- a couple of compounds. We're not focusing on a single compound here. There's many ganoderic acids, so it's a a big collection, but we are trying to focus on this collection and eliminating other things. One of the main benefits this has is that you can now consume a dose of ganoderic acids that would normally take a huge amount of fruiting bodies. This can be problematic because the fruiting bodies contain beta-glucans, and beta-glucans in low amounts are totally fine for most people. They don't produce any gastrointestinal distress in normal doses. In fact, they can actually be beneficial for your gut microbiome and for intestinal function. However, in really high doses, which you would need if you wanted to get high doses of ganoderic acids, you would be consuming a lot and this can cause some issues. So basically, if you just want the ganoderic acid effects, which We'll talk about a little bit later exactly why you want that. But if you want that, you need a high ganoderic acid standardization. So two things are necessary for that. One, finding someone who can actually extract that high of a level of ganoderic acids from Ganoderma lucidum. The second is actually being able to test the ganoderic acids. And this has been a a bit of a challenge and it took us a long time to develop a method for ganoderic acids, but we have a really good one now. So we can actually test very reliably for ganoderic acids in our lab now. And this allowed us to go through many, many extracts uh, looking for ganoderic acid. And then we found this one, 9% ganoderic acids, which is uh, let's see, 7% higher than any other ganoderic acid extract we've ever seen. So highest we've seen is 2%. That's pretty exciting, especially considering that it was a challenging process to get that method correct. But now we have the higher standardization and we have the ability to test for it and excellent quality control. Yes. So this is a really interesting extract, uh, very different than any other Rishi out there. The interesting thing about the ganoderic acids is 
they have a lot more cognitive effects. So they seem to have certain GABAergic effects, uh, some sleep promoting effects, some cognition enhancing effects, some neuroplasticity enhancing effects. It also has some effects on hormone levels, but most importantly, the ganoderic acids also have really unique inflammation balancing effects, especially in our joints, lungs. Um, so for controlling inflammation, high levels of ganoderic acids are very beneficial. There are also a lot of other beneficial effects associated with these ganoderic acids. This would be a really long list to list off right now, so we will do a podcast on the ganoderic acids and red reishi in general in the future, and then we can really dive deep. But for now, the important thing to remember is, one, you are getting a high amount of ganoderic acids here that can't really be found anywhere else. It's actually verified by proper lab testing. And if you really want to experience selectively the effects of what ganoderic acids can do, a little bit more separated from the beta-glucans and other polysaccharides, this is the extract for you. And you mentioned earlier that this is a very different extract than other red reishi extracts on the market. Aside from the high standardization of ganoderic acids, what makes it different? So do you mean in terms of effects? Yeah, in terms of effects. So in terms of effects, like I was saying earlier, you get more of that cognition effect. So the calming effects are a little bit more noticeable. The sleep promoting effects are a little bit more noticeable. The way I like to describe the effects of ganoderic acids is that it produces a very natural feeling sense of calm. Oftentimes, even with some subtle things like, for example, lemon balm, which is one of my favorite calming supplements, and I believe it's actually one of Erica's favorites too. Yeah, definitely it does really feel like something is active in your system and it's producing that, which is nice because it produces a really potent effect, but it is kind of clear that there is something active in your system. Somehow with at least my experience with the ganoderic acids, and I've heard it from a few other people, is that it just feels like your state of relaxation is optimized, like you are hanging out on a hammock, reading a book, that kind of feeling, rather than a more pronounced calming, very relaxing effect like with lemon balm. So I feel like during daily life it's a really nice one to add on just to to kind of optimize your mental state throughout the day. I really like it for that. It's really nice for sleep and the and the inflammation balancing effects and oxidation balancing effects are quite noticeable in the fact that it has a pain management effect. It can also it, if you're having some some allergies, it could help a little bit there too. Um, it can help a little bit with uh, respiration, can make breathing a little bit easier, and the effects on inflammation and oxidation also translate to further cognitive benefits because if you have inflammation ongoing in your brain and oxidation, your cognitive function is a little bit limited. So if you can get something in your brain, like the ganoderic acids, that already have cognition enhancing effects, then the combination of balancing neuroinflammation, neurooxidation, and having separate mechanisms of increasing cognitive function makes it a really interesting uh, mushroom supplement for cognitive health in general. Wow, very cool. I'm convinced. And I would love to try it one day as a calming supplement and then try lemon balm the next day just to compare them kind of back to back because I like the idea of this having a calming effect without it feeling like this external or very potent um, actor within my system. Something a little bit more subtle and that I could add on to my stack every day that wouldn't kind of upset the balance but might help me achieve a little bit more of that calming and cognition boost. Yeah, and I know that you are really into yoga and I feel like having a little bit of this ultra potent red reishi extract before a yoga session could really help enhance that relaxant effect of yoga and not have it feel like something else is taking over, more complementing the natural feeling you get from something like yoga. Absolutely, especially because uh, the yoga that I practice is so much focused on breathing and on quieting the mind, so this seems like it would be a really nice complement. Absolutely. Very cool.
All right, let's move on to the next new product from this past month, which is Solidrosol tablets. Now, Emil, give us a basic understanding of what is Solidrosol, where does it come from, and why might someone be interested in taking this supplement? Yeah, so this one is actually a really old product, maybe one of our older products oldest products that we've ever had because it came from Serotropic, which was the first company we ever had. And it was always in a dropper bottle solution. So in that original dropper bottle solution, we had pure isolated solidricide and tyrosol, which are both found in Rhodiola rosea. So if you look, for example, at our Rhodiola rosea 3% solidricide extract, you have a very significant solidricide content, but also a lot of other things going on, and the tyrosol content is a little bit low. This is really interesting because solidricide is the glycoside of tyrosol, or other way around, tyrosol is the aglycone of solidricide. What that means is that solidricide chemically speaking, is very similar to tyrosol. The only difference is a glucose or a sugar group. And when that sugar group falls off, we have tyrosol. And when we consume something that contains solidricide, like rhodiola rosea, our body is very good at pulling off these sugar groups from a compound. So we end up with the aglycone, which is tyrosol. And tyrosol has a lot of unique benefits and actually also further metabolizes in our body to hydroxytyrosol, which has further benefits. But the interesting thing about having a high concentration of tyrosol and solidricide, which you basically cannot find in any rhodiola extract because tyrosol is always going to be low, means that you have much more rapid effects because I think a lot of the energizing effects of rhodiola rosea is because of this effect where solidricide in your body turns into tyrosol. So by supplying tyrosol right away, the effects are really rapid and more energizing. The way I would describe the effect of solidricol then is you basically distill all of the energizing effects from rhodiola rosea and you clean it up a little bit. So it feels really clean, zippy, you basically just get that energizing effect of rhodiola and you get it a lot quicker. So this is a really interesting one if you need a quick energy boost, you don't necessarily want to consume caffeine, but you also don't necessarily want to wait for something to take 45 minutes to an hour to kick in, you want something to kick in really quick, then Salutrosol is a good option, especially because you can utilize it sublingually. So this brings me to the next point of why this is a new product, it's we took the solution, the solution was always meant to be dropped underneath your tongue, but not, it seems like not a lot of people like solutions, so we wanted to move away from the solution a little bit and offer this product in a non-solution form, which actually does make it a little bit easier to travel with, because if you're in an airplane with a solution bottle, especially one that's full, it could maybe leak a little bit due to the pressure changes when you're in the air and when you're landing, etc. So having it available as a tablet makes it a little bit more useful for people who are traveling. And to be honest, having something like Solidrosol while you're traveling could help offset some of the tiredness of traveling. So in these tablets, they're not just normal tablets, they are quick dissolving tablets, so you can kind of put, place them underneath your tongue and let them slowly dissolve there, then you can take advantage of some sublingual and buccal dosing, which will then speed up how fast it, the solidricide and tyrosol can get into your bloodstream, and then the effects are even more rapid, and can even be a little bit more potent. So having it in these quick dissolve tablets is kind of the ideal scenario here. You get these isolated, pure compounds that are in rhodiola rosea, and it's in a novel delivery form, which leads to really unique rapid effects. This is one that's been a, a fan favorite since the early days, since Serotropic, which is why after we closed down Serotropic, this was one of the products that we carried over by popular demand. And now it's here, sort of by popular demand again, in a new form. So this is a really cool one and has a nice nostalgia for us at the office. Awesome. And definitely nice to be able to take something in a quick dissolve tablet form rather than a solution because it's more convenient, less mess, 
and less guessing when it comes to dosages as well. Absolutely. Awesome. Now let's move on to the last new product from this past month. This one is a very exciting and um, innovative product that we've come out with, and it's a version of one of my favorite products. It is the Omega Tau V capsules. So these are vegan Omega Tau capsules, and aside from the cognitive benefits and the mood benefits, um, Emil, tell us a little bit about what makes this particular product so special. Yeah, so... Omega Tau, for those that aren't familiar with Omega Tau, is our take on the Mr. Happy Stack. And for those not familiar with the Mr. Happy Stack, this is a community-driven stack that was created on a forum called Longevity, and it was the conversation was started by a user called Mr. Happy, and then lots of users chimed in, and over many, many pages in this forum post, this stack was put together that would provide all of the building blocks for neuronal membranes. So for example, choline, uridine, DHA from fish oil. All of these are then coming together to provide a really nice solid foundation onto which you can build other nootropic stacks. And in the the main effect that the users were documenting in the longevity forum back in the day was mood enhancement, uh, significant cognition enhancement and actually increased sensitivity to things like caffeine because they believe that this stack was also helping to enhance overall dopaminergic function. When we initially did Omega Tau, the, so one thing to remember with the Mr. Happy Stack, it was never a, a product, it was just a community driven uh, stack that was put together and then you had to go out there and find all of the individual ingredients and there's quite a lot of ingredients in it so sourcing all of the ingredients and making sure they were all pure and that you were actually getting what you were buying especially back in the wild west days of nootropics where there was a lot of bad stuff out there I mean there still is but back then it was really hard to even find something like uridine sometimes so the one aspect of Omega Tau that we really wanted to pursue, and this is why it took us a long time to come out with this stack, was to have it in an all-in-one product. So you don't have to go out and source eight different ingredients and then take eight different capsules or powders. You can simply just take two capsules and have the full Mr. Happy stack. When we were first developing Omega Tau, though, fish oil as the name implies, is an oil, it's a liquid. So that means you have to formulate it as a soft gel. Well, formulating soft gels is incredibly difficult. And it must be even more difficult to formulate a soft gel with eight different ingredients. Yes, so, so if some ingredients are water soluble and some ingredients are a, a fat, then they are not going to mix together. So maybe then you can make an emulsion and then put the emulsion in, but then maybe the emulsion will split and maybe some of the water inside of it will degrade the soft gel material so you have to do really long-term stability testing to make sure that your uh, soft gels don't fail and if they do fail then it's basically six months down the drain and you have to start over so, so altogether a much too complicated unreliable process absolutely it's really a process we didn't want to go down and we quite quickly understood why there weren't really a lot of soft gel stacks out there. If you do see it, it's maybe one or two different ingredients mixed together, but you, you're not going to see eight different ingredients with different solubilities and different solvents. It's just a really bad idea. So we needed to find a fish oil that you could have in a powder. And this doesn't, at the time when we were first looking into it, didn't really exist. And then we found this thing called Avalom, which is fish oil that has been complexed with the amino acid lysine. And that turns it into a powder, but it also means that you have an increase in bioavailability. And Avalom, in some of their studies, have shown that this is a five times increase in bioavailability. So... One, you can now formulate a dry capsule so you don't have to do a soft gel with fish oil, in it, fish oil in it. And two, you don't need as much space in a capsule. This is something that's always difficult when making a stack. You always have to be cognizant of the amount of space that you have in a capsule because it's limited. Um, so if you have to put in a very high amount of fish oil powder inside of a capsule, then it's still not possible. So 
finding a Velon was really the key to making a Mega Tau, making the Mr. Happy Stack into an all-in-one product. So this took quite a lot of effort to get there. But then now it's not vegan friendly. And this was also a bit of an issue with the classic Mr. Happy Stack. If you were vegan or vegetarian or simply just don't like consuming fish products, then you were mostly out of luck unless you found a really high quality algae based DHA supplement, which at the time wasn't as prevalent as it is now. Uh, as time has progressed and veganism and vegetarianism is becoming a little bit more popular, especially mainstream popular, and I feel like more accepted for some strange reason, veganism and vegetarianism wasn't really that accepted a decade ago. Um, I feel like the attitude towards veganism and vegetarianism and more sustainability is getting a lot better, but that also means that there's more of a demand for it. Um, but Avalom, luckily, also makes a lysine complex algae DHA powder. And them coming out with this product made it so that we can now formulate a vegan-friendly and vegetarian-friendly Omega Tau product, or Mr. Happy Stack. And because more people are becoming vegan and vegetarian and there is more of a demand, we wanted to meet this demand by having this vegan product. So this is where Omega Tau V came from. But we identified a few other things that would make Omega Tau an even more useful product to someone who is vegan or vegetarian. Rather than just switching out the fish oil for algal DHA oil, we also did a lot of research determining the key micronutrient deficiencies in vegans and vegetarians. So these were, from what we found, selenium, iodine, vitamin B12, and iron. And all of these micronutrients are also very important for cognitive health. And if a vegan and or vegetarian is low in these, then their cognitive function is likely a little bit below baseline. A lot of vegans and vegetarians already supplement with B12. Iodine and iron and selenium are not as common though. But the interesting thing here is if you really want to dial in your cognitive function and you don't want to take a whole lot of different products, then you can basically stop taking your vitamin B12 supplement and just take Omega Tau V. So it kind of functions as a nootropic vitamin for vegans then because it helps fix some of the main deficiencies that are there which will then help bring you back up to a more normal cognitive baseline, especially with vitamin B12. And then you provide all of the other nutrients like algae derived high bioavailability because the Avalom technology also works on the algae oil. So it is also five times more bioavailable. So you have this high bioavailability bioavailability DHA, which vegans and vegetarians also tend to be a little bit low in DHA. We all tend to be a little bit low in DHA though, by the way. Whether you are a vegan or vegetarian or a meat eater, most people are a little bit low on DHA, which is also why the Mr. Happy Stack works, because it provides this in quite a high amount. And you need DHA in addition to choline and uridine for uh, brain membrane synthesis. So this is the whole concept behind it. And we took that concept of fixing some of these common deficiencies a little bit further with a Mega Tau V, one that fixes a bunch of different things for vegans and vegetarians and allows them to experience the effects of the Mr. Happy Stack in a very convenient form factor. Wow, that's really exciting and awesome that we have these options to not only optimize cognition and mood and these different functions in our brains, but we also have a really sustainable option to purchase with this Omega Tau V, um, something that a lot of different people can take regardless of your dietary restrictions or preferences. So very cool. And honestly, even though I'm not vegan or vegetarian, I don't consume a whole lot of meat. So I am more of a occasional meat eater rather than a daily meat eater. So for me, I probably have some similar deficiencies and I've been taking Omega Tau, but I probably will actually switch to Omega Tau V because having some of those extra micronutrients in there that I might be a little bit low in anyways is really nice. So it becomes an even more complete product. And 
the idea of a more sustainable DHA source is also kind of nice. Definitely. Nobody has to miss out on the beneficial effects of Omega Tau now. Definitely. All right. So now that we've covered the three new product releases since our last podcast, the Red Rishi Concentrated Ganoderic Acid Extract Capsules, Soligerosol Tablets, and Omega Tau V Capsules, it's time to jump into this month's topic, which is saffron, the world's most expensive spice, and perhaps the world's most underrated spice and source of mood boosting and just general health benefits. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about saffron and its benefits and where it came from and how widely it's used across different cultures until we started researching for this podcast, but it's been really fascinating to see how saffron is used in food dishes around the world, but also as a supplement to help with a variety of different health issues and how many different benefits it has for us. So we're going to start just from the beginning. Um, talking about the traditional uses and the origins of saffron, where it's grown, um, how it's processed, why it's so expensive, and basically starting with the beautiful purple flower itself that you see on the thumbnail here, um, and getting a little bit into the details of just this source material that we begin with, the saffron flower. Yeah, and there's a lot of really surprising things to unpack here. I was quite familiar with saffron, but a lot of the effects I wasn't familiar with. And one thing I wasn't familiar with either is that it's actually featured in uh, music. So one song that maybe a lot of us are familiar with is Mellow Yellow by Donovan. And Erica actually is also a musician and a great vocalist, so I'll have her sing the lyrics for you right here. I didn't prepare for this, so I'm not going to sing it, but I will tell you the lyrics in a in a uh, musical fashion. Okay, so here goes. I'm just mad about Saffron. A Saffron's mad about me. I'm just a mad about Saffron. She's just mad about me. They call me Mellow Yellow, quite rightly. They call me Mellow Yellow. That's it. That's the beginning of the song. So I actually didn't know that those lyrics were there at all. Yeah, I've heard this song so many times. Um, I never realized that it was about saffron, which makes sense because when you use saffron in dishes, it turns everything yellow. And it turns things yellow, but the actual source from where that color comes from is this really, really deep beautiful red color, which we're all probably a little bit more familiar with, but the more it dilutes, the more yellow it becomes. But I would say saffron almost has the same kind of pigment power as uh, turmeric or curcumin's orange. Yes. And the interesting thing is if you do, and if you look at our uh, saffron extract, it is bright red, like brick red, but the moment it goes into solution, it, it starts turning yellow. And because it is such an expensive spice, you usually use quite a small amount of it. But because it has such a powerful dyeing ability, instead of it turning everything red, it will turn everything a beautiful yellow color. And I think another really interesting thing about Donovan's lyrics here, and the title of the song is Mellow Yellow, it's not just the yellow color that you can achieve with saffron, but saffron actually has a calming effect. So the mellowness makes sense too there. Definitely. I never made that connection before, but now we can start to draw some similarities or some references from pop culture and from music in future podcast episodes of In Search of Insight. So I'm excited to discover some more songs that have uh, botanical references either in their names or their lyrics. This is going to be fun. Yeah, I actually found out about this because I was looking at some cultivation videos about uh, saffron and one of the YouTube users commented just the lyrics of Mellow Yellow. And then I realized, hey, it's about saffron. It's all about the YouTube comments sometimes. You never know what you're going to learn. Yeah, there's definitely some uh, special nuggets of information in there. Along with all of the uh, stuff that doesn't need to be read or spend time on. So after this beautiful um, and fun tangent, let's get back to what we were talking about with saffron, its traditional uses. Yes. So traditionally, and when we talk about traditional uses, oftentimes we're going back a few thousand years, maybe a few hundred years. But saffron, it seems like we can go even further back. Maybe it's one of the oldest spices around and one of the oldest medicinally used spices around. There 
is references to saffron that date back about 50,000 years. So it seems like maybe we've known about saffron for already 50,000 years and we've been using it for 50,000 years. More interestingly though is that about 3,500 years ago is apparently when some of the first saffron farms started. So we've actually been purposefully cultivating this spice. And this is also really interesting because without human intervention, there probably wouldn't be a whole lot of uh, saffron because saffron's flowers are actually sterile. So most uh, flowers, they can reproduce through the pollen in the, the flowers, but saffron doesn't work like this. Saffron, multi it grows from a something called a corm, which is kind of like this bulb. And the bulb during the summer actually lies dormant on the ground and while it's dormant the corms multiply but they multiply underground and they don't really spread out so humans can go in dig up some of these corms and then distribute them a little bit further away and then these corms will become productive and they will produce flowers and then once they go into their dormant state again the next summer, they will produce more corms and you dig those up again and you replant those and you just keep going like this. That's really interesting. So do you know if saffron flowers are, they're not pollinated by bees or other insects, right? No. So it doesn't seem like it, It, but bees do go in and they get covered in the pollen and there's pictures of this happening, but it doesn't seem like they produce like this and and you have to if you grow saffron you just have to get these corms which this is one of the things that adds a lot of complexity to saffron farming already so this is just kind of laying the the groundwork for why this is so expensive because the cultivation methods are very specialized and this is why it's actually quite interesting that we've already been doing this for 3500 years because why would you go through so much trouble to grow a flower? It, you grow through this much trouble because it has some really beneficial effects and it's culturally very important. This also brings up the question, where does saffron come from? And this is a very hotly debated topic because Iran is one of the highest, the largest producer of saffron and They've been doing it for a long time too, so it's oftentimes claimed that it's coming from Iran. What actually seems to be the case that it's coming more from Greece and maybe the island of Crete. And the ancient Greeks used a lot of saffron. And they were some of the first people to also cultivate saffron and, and used a lot of saffron in dishes and for a lot of different ailments. And then it probably came over to Iran and the rest of the Middle East and then this is where to this day most cultivation of saffron is happening in Iran partially because their soils are perfect for the cultivation of saffron. When we were doing research for this podcast about saffron's origins I was surprised to find out that saffron grows in dry dirt so not like a super wet and moist environment, but more of like a dry, arid environment where you can see in a lot of these videos, the dirt is cracking and kind of crumbling, uh, but there's these beautiful purple and red saffron flowers that are growing very healthy in these dry environments. Yeah. So actually, if you have a lot of moisture in the soil, the corms will rot and then it's game over. If your corms rot, then, then that's it. If you can't get any more corms from anywhere, then if you have a saffron farm, it's over. You can pack your bags and leave. It's surprising when you think about the kind of bulb nature of the saffron, how it starts out, because when I think about other bulb flowers or even foods, I'm thinking about the, the fact that you're from Holland. I'm thinking about tulips and I'm thinking about some of these other flowers. Um, bulbs that grow in really, really wet, moist environments. Saffron is kind of like the opposite, even though it comes in a similar sort of bulb form. Well, that's where things get a little bit interesting, because tulips, just like 
saffron, which by the way, I, I haven't even mentioned the scientific name yet. I always like mentioning that it's crocus sativus. So there's a bunch of different crocus species and they're all perennial species, which means they grow from a bulb. And tulips are also perennial species. They also grow from a bulb and their growth uh, parameters are a little bit similar actually to saffron. So it's interesting that then in a country where there's a lot of water everywhere, there's a lot of rain, how can you then have good tulip production? And it's because the soils are perfect. And recently, saffron cultivation in the US has started to pick back up um, because of the University of Vermont. They have a saffron growing project going on, a whole department, I think, even. And I was watching one of their webinars, and they had a bunch of saffron farmers from Vermont on it, and they were talking about where they get their corms from. And they get their corms from the Netherlands. So, big... The Netherlands is a huge flower producer, a lot of tulips, so... And we've been doing this for a really long time. So we're very specialized at producing these perennial bulbs, these corms of tulips, and actually of saffron too, which apparently we've been doing since the 1800s. And a lot of the saffron that's being grown in the US is being done with Dutch corms. What's even more interesting, and this really blew my mind, is that they call them Pennsylvania Dutch, which Dutch people are people from the Netherlands, but I guess something got a little bit lost in translation and the Pennsylvania Dutch are actually seem a little bit more German. And one of their nicknames was Heel Dutch, which translates to Yellow Dutch, sort of. I think this is a German word, not necessarily a Dutch word, but they were called Yellow Dutch because of the distinctive golden hue to a lot of their food. So it turns out these Mennonites in Pennsylvania and Hutterites in, in Canada and also throughout the US, they grow saffron, they cultivate it, and they use it in a lot of food. So I was reading one article of someone who said, yeah, they didn't realize for a really long time that chicken pot pie normally isn't laced with large amounts of saffron. And if you had to buy saffron, this chicken pot pie would be the most expensive chicken pot pie on the planet. But the Pennsylvania Dutch and the, the even current day Mennonites and Hutterites, they use saffron in a lot of their dishes and they cultivate it too. So cultivation of saffron has happened in the US since the 1700s, it seems. And now it's picking back up. So that's quite interesting. But it also just showcases how widespread the use of saffron is. So in Spain, you have a lot of saffron use, probably a lot of trading with um, countries surrounding Iran and even Iran. And then it ended up in India and it ended up in Morocco, likely through Spain. Uh, and then somehow it ended up in Pennsylvania probably through Holland or maybe Germany. Yeah, and then if you consider the dry, arid growing conditions in Iran, you don't really see that in Pennsylvania, which is kind of the opposite, actually. You don't see it in Vermont, where apparently a lot of saffron cultivation is now taking place. And you don't see it in the Netherlands, where a lot of the corms are being produced. So what really seems to matter is the quality of the soil, how well it drains, and if it has any stones and stuff like that in it, and a good calcium content, it seems like. So the growing conditions have to be quite perfect for saffron, but you can cultivate in multiple different parts of the world. There's even a decent amount of uh, saffron cultivation happening in Tasmania. That's been ongoing for a while. Now there's some saffron production happening in South Africa. Um, you have saffron production in Greece, in Italy, uh, in Morocco. Iran and India, but Iran makes about 90% of the world's supply of... Oh, and Spain, by the way, too, they produce some of their own saffron, but Iran produces about 90% of the world's supply of saffron, so they are the biggest player there. 
and it does seem like their soils are really perfect and they've been doing it for a long time so they have a lot of traditional knowledge on how to properly cultivate it and how to harvest it and this is where it gets really difficult so the growth cycle of saffron is a little bit strange you plant the corms and then two months later they are ready to harvest and you have to harvest them very quickly so you don't have a lot of time and you have to harvest them early in the morning before the uh, flowers open up and expose the stigma so that's the little strands the red strands we call that the stigmas so the stigmas are the most valuable part of saffron because they contain the active compounds right yes they contain the active compounds the petals actually do contain some of the active compounds too but the highest concentration is in the stigmas so you want that the problem with this though is that each uh, saffron flower only has three stigmas and they weigh basically nothing so if you want to get I believe if you want to get five grams of dried saffron strands, you have to harvest at the very least 1,000 flowers. So if you want a kilo, you have to harvest a lot of flowers. And that's a lot of manual labor. And being out in the middle of the desert in Iran, being very bent over because they grow low to the ground, you have to harvest them. And then you have to strip the stigmas from the petals. This is all being done by hand, so now we can start to make sense of why saffron is so expensive, because in a single flower you only have three strands and you're grabbing these flowers very carefully so as not to damage the other flowers that might grow at a later point, and also processing the flowers, not damaging any part of it. Um, It's all very time-consuming. Extremely time-consuming and very, very low yields because you just need to harvest a lot of flowers and these flowers need a lot of space to grow. So very difficult. And this is part of the reason why it is the most expensive spice in the world. This is also why farmers in Vermont and other parts of the US and South Africa and Tasmania are getting into saffron production too, because while saffron from Iran and India can sell for about five dollars a gram on the uh, the market wholesale, we end up paying way more for it per gram. But in U.S. grown, locally grown saffron can sell for even more, like twenty-five to seventy-five dollars a gram. So, if you can properly cultivate saffron there is a potentially very high monetary reward. So this makes it really interesting for farmers, but it also is really hard to do. And there's a lot of manual labor involved. So this then makes it a lot less interesting, but... It would require a lot of people with specialized skills and experience. Yes, which it makes a lot of sense why the University of Vermont now has a dedicated program for saffron cultivation, because... This is maybe a, a, a big crop that can be grown in the US and create a lot of job opportunities just like it has in Iran and India and Greece. And the global demand for saffron seems to be picking up. So every year, for some reason, the US seems to import more and more saffron, even though a lot of people are still quite unfamiliar with saffron in the US as a spice to use in food. But it's becoming more popular and I have to say I keep running into it in the wild a little bit more too recently I was at a coffee shop and they had a saffron infused latte this is the first I've ever really seen that pop up here I grew up with a good amount of saffron uh, in my childhood but I've never really seen it pop up in the wild here but now it is and it seems like Americans now have a bit of a taste for saffron and it's picking up which then makes sense that we're looking at local cultivation of saffron. So you mentioned uh, that Americans might be growing a taste for saffron, and I thought this might be a good time to just briefly talk about the taste of saffron itself for anyone who hasn't tried it or isn't as familiar with it. Now, I can only report my experience from tasting our saffron extract, not a fresh strand from a saffron flower, but 
The saffron extract has a very, very um, distinct molasses, maple, honey flavor, um, but it's also accompanied by a very intense bitterness as well, and almost a metallic flavor too. It's quite complex, it's fairly sweet, uh, but when you're taking it, let's say, sublingually under your tongue, that sweetness is kind of matched and sometimes masked by an intense bitterness. Yeah, and saffron is very intense in its flavor, which is really good because it means you can use a small amount of it and have a very profound impact on the food you're making and a profound impact on the color because a very, very small amount of saffron will color a lot of rice. So for example, paella from, uh, and I know I butchered that name, but that dish from Spain it has very yellow rice and that yellow color is coming from saffron but you don't strongly taste saffron in that dish necessarily like you would if you just eat saffron pure or take our extract pure that's a very intense flavor and it's somewhat unpleasant in its pure form but when you dilute it in something and you use a small amount it can produce some really unique complex flavors so honey-like notes, a little bit of bitterness, a um, nice volatile aroma. It, it can give certain things. It has a bit of a potpourri type of fragrance to it. Yeah, it's quite floral. So if you use it in the right concentration, and this is quite similar to any spice, if you just eat cinnamon pure it's also not the most pleasant thing on the planet for most people, but if you use a little bit of it in foods, it becomes really pleasant. So saffron works in a similar way. If you use a small amount of it, you get this really nice, complex, floral, honey, a little bit of bitterness. One of the examples that we saw in our research was uh, the use of saffron in black tea. Uh, not as a sweetener, but just as an ingredient to kind of add complexity and a sort of special quality to the tea uh, along with sugar. So you can imagine that combining that floral sweetness of the saffron with a tea flavor and then a little bit of sugar as well would be a much more interesting drink than just the plain black tea by itself. Absolutely. This is also where we can get into some of the um, bioactives in saffron because the bioactives are directly related to the taste and the um, dye properties. So if you've, if you've taken our saffron extract or you've ever looked at it, you'll see that it's standardized for 7.5% crocins and 1% saffronol. These are the two... Saffronol is a single compound. Crocins, there's multiple of them. These are some of the main bioactives in saffron. There's 150 different compounds, though, in saffron, and so far we've only even been able to identify like a third of them, so I think we know about 50 compounds in saffron. We know what they are. There's a hundred more that we haven't necessarily identified yet, but we know they're there. So, for the most part, though, we are looking at crocins which provide a lot of color so the crocins are bright red and they are producing most of the dye then you have picrocrocin which provides a, the bitter flavor and for some people this can be interpreted as a little bit metallic some people taste more of the, the metallic flavor some people interpret it more as bitterness i think i kind of fall right in between pure it does have the bitterness transitions into a bit of a metallic taste um, but when it's incorporated into food so this morning for example i put a dose of it in my oatmeal and in the oatmeal the it was just a nice bitterness and, and no metallic flavor and a little bit of that floral honey like taste but the bitterness is coming from picrocrocin the dye is coming from crocin and the, the smell the kind of floral honey like smell that Erica was describing that's coming from saffronol and that's one of the volatile 
components, and safranol is actually a terpene. This is where things get really interesting and a little bit complex. So we will flash an image up on the screen now, so you can follow along if you're on YouTube. It, it might make a little bit more sense what we're talking about. We'll also talk a little bit about how the stigmas look during the growth cycle, and this will give us some clues. So when the stigmas are young, they look a little bit yellow, and then they start to transition into orange, and then they start to transition into red. So if you look at a lot of saffron, you will actually see that the stigmas still transition. Most of it is red, but then you have an orange portion and then a yellow portion. And this basically depends on how mature the stigmas are. The more mature the stigmas are, the more red they become. And this gives some important clues as to where the crocins come from and the other bioactives because there's clearly some chemical change happening there. And the crocins, crocetins, and safranal are all being synthesized from beta-carotene, which is a vitamin A compound. And beta-carotene is also one of the things that gives carrots their orange color. So you have this compound in there that's producing this yellowish-orange hue. I just made a connection between carrots and saffron. Sometimes when you eat a really fresh carrot, it has a very intense sweetness, but also a bit of a bitterness on like the sides of your tongue and the back of your mouth. And I never made that connection before between carrots and saffron, having not eaten very much saffron-containing foods before. But now I'm on a totally different thought train with beta carotene. Keep going. So this is, I've actually never tasted pure beta carotene, so I'm not sure if that has a bitter flavor, but there can definitely be a, a whole lot of different compounds in carrots that produce a bit of flavor. But it's definitely an interesting thing to think about because the beta carotene can turn into zeaxanthin. And zeaxanthin is present in the immature stigmas in very high concentrations, and zeaxanthin looks yellow. So this is why the stigmas to begin with are yellow, because they just contain a lot of zeaxanthin. Then, as you can see on the screen, due to oxidative cleavage, you get the two ends of the zeaxanthin molecule get cleaved off, and then you end up with 3 hydroxy beta cyclocitrol which I think is abbreviated to HTCC, so let's keep going with that abbreviation, that's a little easier. And dialdehyde. So you have these two compounds now. The dialdehyde then gets further processed into crocetin, as you can see. And then the crocetins turn into crocin. And when the crocetin turns into crocin, the crocins are crocetin with some extra glucose, some sugar groups on it. So that's what the crocins are. And the crocins have the brightest red color. So you're going from zeaxanthin, due to oxidative cleavage, you get this dialdehyde. Dialdehyde turns into crocetin. Then crocetin gets some sugar groups on it. You have crocins. And as that's happening, the stigmas are becoming more red, which makes sense because the crocins are bright red. And that's our most active compound in the saffron extract, aside from safranol, right? Yes. So now where is safranol coming from? The safranol is coming from the HTCC. The HTCC is turning into picrocrocin. Picrocrocin is HTCC with a sugar group on it and there's some other chemical changes that are happening there. Then the sugar group gets ripped off again, and you have safranol. And safranol is a terpene, it's the volatile thing, it's the thing you smell with saffron. The interesting thing though is, if you pick fresh saffron and you smell it, it will smell like nothing, because there's no safranol. So where does the safranol come from then? So the safranol comes from the drying process. So during the drying, enzymes get activated and then the enzymes 
cleave off the sugar group on the picrocrocin, and then you have safranel. So the drying stage is also crucial for saffron. Because when you just harvest the stigmas and you don't dry them, and you don't dry them properly, they're not good. Because safranel is one of the quality markers, and it's actually being tested for uh, through an ISO certification thing to look for saffron quality, you need safranel in there. But safranel isn't necessarily in high concentrations in just the raw stigmas. You have to dry them. There has to be more human intervention, similar to maca like we talked about. Absolutely, and makes sense now thinking back to these processing um, videos that we were watching. After removing the stigma from the flower, um, the strands of the red saffron are dried for at least a couple of hours in the sun in the same area that they have been processed. And this is a really essential part of the processing before the saffron is packaged into you know smaller amounts and quantities. So it makes sense that they're drying it in the sun because this is where that quality saffronel is actually being produced. And remember that picrocrocin is bitter. So during the drying, if a lot of the picrocrocin is turning into saffronel, then you are losing some of the bitter quality, which is probably good overall, and you are gaining a very nice aromatic quality, which is what saffron is also very prized for. But the drying is very crucial here. And we saw this in the last podcast about maca. Maca doesn't contain a lot of the bioactives that we want in its raw form. You have to process it and dry it in a very specific manner to get macamites. They, they're they not really in the plant in high amounts raw. And the same thing for saffron. So not only is it very hard to harvest, to cultivate, then to harvest, and you have to harvest a large amount of it, now you have a lot of this ultra delicate stigmas, very light, very delicate, very easy to spoil, and very valuable and now you have to take that and you have to properly dry it to actually get it to taste and smell like the saffron you want so that adds another layer of complexity on top of it and again makes it quite clear why it's so expensive so one of the traditional methods of drying it is actually just sun drying it and then putting it in clay pots too the clay kind of sucks the um, moisture out of it. it works almost similar to a silica packet where clay actually contains a lot of silicates too and so it works kind of in a similar manner so this is one of the traditional ways you put it in you harvest you put it in a clay pot for a little while then you put it in the sun then you put it back in the clay pot and then it dries and as it dries it becomes more fragrant and it seems like from certain Uh, saffron production countries the processing methods are different and this is maybe what also causes big differences between saffron from different uh, growing countries not necessarily because they're growing a different type of saffron they are just processing the saffron differently and this is creating these different flavor and bioactive compounds absolutely so now i'm thinking wouldn't it be cool to try saffron from Iran, and then saffron from India, and then saffron from Vermont, and then saffron from Pennsylvania, and compare the flavor and the aroma and the effects. Absolutely. But another interesting thing, too, is the the chef, the cook that's cooking with the saffron might also have an influence, because it does seem like heating the saffron makes even more of these different types of compounds, which it makes sense that if you're drying it, you're producing some of these compounds, then maybe if you cook with it, you create even more of these compounds. So this is also why maybe if you just eat pure saffron, it's not super pleasant. But when you make a tea out of it, it's a lot more pleasant because you're adding more heat and you're changing more uh, of the compounds around. So maybe when you add heat and you make a tea out of it, maybe a little bit more of the picrocrocin turns into saffronel. So the tea now becomes really nice and fragrant and a little bit less bitter than if you were to just eat the saffron. So there's a lot of interesting things happening here. Yeah, super interesting. And it sounds like from the saffron flower, 
through the harvesting process, the processing of the flower, separating the stigma from the petals, the drying process, and all of the different compounds that are created throughout this. Uh, Saffron is taking a very long journey just to get to this dried form that we might use as a spice in our cooking. But when we think about it uh, being used as a medicine or as a supplement, Um, the process gets even longer uh, when it turns into an extract. So now that we've arrived here, where we can picture this initial saffron flower and all of the steps that it goes through to get to either, you know, our spice product or our extract product, I'm very excited to talk about the effects of saffron, particularly because I took a dose of our saffron extract before we started recording this podcast today. And I want to share a little bit of my own experience with it. So one aspect of this saffron extract that I found really fun and interesting was, I'd say maybe 25 to 30 minutes after taking it, I felt a sense of like happiness, lightness, and I felt like it was easy to laugh. Um, This was one of the first kind of effects that I noticed when I first started feeling the saffron going to work. And this is something that I did experience just a little bit with um, our maca extract in the past, but this was way more pronounced. Like I genuinely found it, everything was funny. I felt like the sense of lightness and, and just kind of an overall like big mood boost, like the sun came out even though it's dark outside. Um, So that was the first thing that I noticed. And then that feeling of kind of giddiness sort of smoothed out a little bit over time. Now it's been about an hour and 15 minutes since I've taken the saffron. And I do feel that I can speak more confidently and smoothly. I feel like my mind is a little bit clearer. I definitely have an energy boost. um, And I also just feel that physically I'm a bit more relaxed as well. Um, This isn't something that's maybe as pronounced as other calming supplements I've taken in the past, like um, lemon balm, for example, which has a lot more of a a sort of drowsy and like pleasurably calming effect. This saffron calming feels like uh, a warm sun and cool breeze on the skin. And it also has that same kind of effect mentally as well. And it's really interesting that you mention all of these things because we actually haven't talked about the traditional effects much together. I've done a lot of this research on my own and so Erica doesn't know that this is actually one of the main traditional uses. And I was watching a video of an Iranian woman who was discussing saffron and she was saying her mother would always say, don't take too much saffron, you will get too giddy. So the fact that you are noticing giddiness, this is really one of the things that it's known for traditionally as well. And if you look at the traditional uses, one of the main things that always pops up, no matter where it's being used, is that it's being used as a mood booster. So this seems to be a really prominent effect. And it's oftentimes actually described as like warm rays of sun hitting you and having this lightness and uh, just general comfort. And in a second, we will look at some of the pharmacology and it will start making a lot of sense. I also took a dose of saffron before this podcast started. And I also noticed the similar thing. Another thing I'm noticing is I was experiencing some soreness, uh, especially in my neck a little bit and my shoulders. did some kayaking this weekend so I'm a little bit sore from that still but the saffron is smoothing that out and similar to what Erica was saying my body does feel a little bit more relaxed and also a little bit more pain free and again traditionally this is one of the uses it is used as a pain management thing and it's used for inflammation and oxidation And another really interesting thing that it's used for is vision, so enhancing your uh, eye health. And if we go back to where these compounds are coming from, they are coming from vitamin A type compounds, from beta carotene. And There's the carrot connection. Yeah, so what have you heard about carrots, Erica? They make your eyesight better. Yeah, and they, uh, this is not entirely true, by the way. Sure, but but that's what everybody says. That's what everyone says. You have to eat a lot of carrots. 
Um, but there is an element of truth to it, and the beta carotene does uh, have an effect on your retinal cells, and zeaxanthin also has this effect. But it also seems like the crocin, crocetin, the picrocrocin, safranal all have beneficial effects on vision, and it's traditionally been used for vision. Another big use of it seems to be for menstruating women, so for both the pain and the mood deficits that can happen around menstruation. So again, this makes a lot of sense if you just hear our report of what it's doing right now as it's active in our system. I don't want to speak for you here, but could you imagine that this would help with some of those mood issues and maybe some of the cramping? Oh, absolutely. Um, I I think depending on your experience with cramping, it can be a very sensitive and difficult issue to address with supplements. So I would honestly have to try it myself to give an honest review. But for mood purposes, absolutely. This is something that I would definitely want to include in my my PMS and my menstrual stack because I do feel like a lot of kind of stress and overthinking is relieved by saffron. Like it definitely gives a much clearer mind. And I think that this is one of the more unfortunate side effects of the menstrual cycle and changing hormones. Um, Saffron seems like it would be a really, really good addition to some of these other kind of calming and soothing supplements that we've discussed in past podcast episodes that are specifically working on hormones. And if I look at the pharmacology of saffron, it would seem to me as a perfect fit for premenstrual syndrome or just menstruation in general. And this is then also backed up by traditional use. So maybe for thousands of years it's already been used like this. So I think this is a really interesting thing. And it also seems when I really was diving into the traditional uses, there almost didn't seem to be an end to the benefits. And this almost reminds me a little bit of how Panax ginseng works within traditional Chinese medicine, where you see it pop up a lot because it helps with a lot of different things. And saffron seems to do a very similar thing. It's also traditionally often used for cardiovascular benefits, for blood flow enhancement and things like that, and modern research has shown that saffron has very beneficial effects for our cardiovascular system. So this is another really interesting traditional use that's then also been verified by science. So now it makes a lot of sense, one, why it seems like humans have been purposefully cultivating saffron from a really long time. And again, kind of coming back to the origin of it, it does seem like maybe it was a different species at some point, but through very uh, a lot of human intervention and selection for different traits, then we ended up with Crocus sativus. And it seems like it might have come from a different Crocus species around Crete, and then went over to Iran and the rest of the Middle East and, and South Asia to uh, India. So it's a really interesting spice and medicinal herb that's been in use for a really, really, really long time and has a lot of uses. And when we first came out with the saffron extract, I honestly thought it was just going to be good for moon and that's about it. But learning about all of these different effects, it makes sense why it is such a prized herb. It also makes sense why it's so expensive. And despite its high cost, that it's still being used. Definitely. And one thing I think that's interesting about comparing our previous knowledge of saffron to what we know now after our research is that I think saffron is perhaps underappreciated and a little bit uh, less understood in Western cultures, which seems to be the case for a lot of botanicals that we talk about on this podcast. I was familiar with the color of saffron and how expensive it was and how kind of limited it is when you go to a store to buy it. It's coming in very small quantities. Okay, in these and jars. that's where we have to talk about something important too. I just remembered there's a lot of counterfeiting happening with saffron. Aha. Uh-huh. Because it is so expensive and because it is so hard to grow. 
but because there are such large amounts of money on the table, there's a lot of adulteration happening from just straight up dyed plastic um, Yikes. to safflower, which safflower produces these kind of petals that somewhat look like the stigmas of saffron especially if you just put them in some dye so if you were to just go out to a store and you buy any random saffron especially if it seems a little bit too cheap then more than likely it's fake so this is a big problem and you need to do a lot of species testing and we've done this of course so our extract is from the stigmas we've confirmed that there is crocin and saffronal in there, which is also important to note because saffron seems to be one of, if not the only plant that produces these compounds. So that's really interesting. So if you look for crocin and saffronal and crocetin and you do species testing, then you can get a clear picture of is this real saffron and our extract is real saffron but just going to the store and picking up saffron you have a good chance of basically being scammed oh okay that's good to know because i was thinking about some stores that i won't mention here um and how saffron becomes available at a certain point in the year especially around the holidays but I always wonder to myself, um, why is it sold in such small quantities? Now I know a little bit more about the processing and the background, so that makes sense. But the idea that it's uh, getting a lot of, or it's making a lot of profit for people also makes sense why there are a lot of counterfeit as well. So back to my point about our previous knowledge of saffron, I would have never thought that you could go into a store and you'd be buying fake saffron. So now that's something I'll look out for. But I also never really considered the kind of similarities with the effects of saffron and its mood benefits and the way that it might be used for its health benefits and how it's going to be used in a food source and how it's going to be used as like a precious part of a lot of different cuisines both because of its flavor and color, but also because of the effect that it has on us psychologically and just physically as well. And this is something that I find fascinating about botanicals because I think in a lot of people's minds, they look at a plant or they look at a flower and they think this is something that grows from the ground. If it's not an obvious food source that we already have, then the thought just sort of ends there. But that's not the case. Humans have been using all kinds of plants and flowers for medicines and health benefits for a very long time and saffron just happens to be one that i think has way more benefits than most people are aware of at least in the western world yeah and the western medical societies tend to look quite negatively on plant-based compounds but the interesting thing is if you go back and and you see the 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 grandfathers of medicine so Hippocrates, they didn't have pharmaceuticals. They were using plant-based compounds and they had very strong knowledge of it. And they were actually also using saffron and they knew how to use it and how to use it for certain disorders. And from that, we have modern medicine. And for some reason, modern medicine has now gone completely, nope, no more natural compounds. It's all synthetic, it's all man-made. And part of this is, of course, how the business model works. It's very hard to patent something in nature. Thank God it would be really bad if that could be done at a large scale. You do see it happening sometimes, and this leads to a lot of problems. But a lot of our knowledge of healthcare came from plants, came from this traditional knowledge, and they are still in use often in non-Western cultures, which is interesting. And... It's interesting that we've kind of abandoned it, but it's also interesting that we can get back into that now a little bit too. Absolutely. The more we know about saffron's benefits and its effects, and we know what to look out for uh, when searching for a quality saffron to use for cooking or a quality extract like ours uh, for its health benefits, the more we can basically enjoy what it has to offer. So this kind of leads us perfectly into talking about the pharmacology of our saffron extract. So how crocins and saffronels are actually uh, moving throughout our bodies and what effects they're having on our health overall. 
Yeah. And there's a lot to go through here. So, Erica, where would you like to start? I really like chronological thinking. So let's start with uh, imagining that it's the beginning of the day and the sun has just risen and we're drinking some uh, tea with saffron or we've just taken a dose of our saffron extract in the morning. Let's start with talking about the energy benefits and the mood benefits of saffron. All right. So let's really focus then on on the brain, the, the neuroscience of it. And there's a lot of interesting information here. So let's start with the calming and also energizing lightness effect that Erica was mentioning. So this is likely coming from the fact that the crocins and saffronel ha- have an effect on GABA. So they seem to be GABA agonists, and similar to something like lemon balm, which also has an effect on GABA, this produces a calming effect. But this calming effect is also accompanied by some mild NMDA antagonism, which also causes a bit of lightness, a little bit of a pain management effect, a little bit of a body comfort effect. So having both that NMDA antagonism and GABA agonism produces a nice, relaxed, almost floaty lightness. Now that's also being backed up by some non-competitive inhibition of monoamine oxidase A and monoamine oxidase B. These are two enzymes that degrade monoamines, and the monoamines are neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So when dopamine serotonin and norepinephrine are released by neurons into the synaptic cleft, they can then bump into these monoamine oxidase enzymes, and those enzymes then break it down. So if you block those enzymes, then you can have higher concentrations of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine around. And having something that's a non-competitive inhibitor means that If there is something that needs to be metabolized by monoamines, by monoamine oxidase, like tyramine, it can actually still metabolize the tyramine, which makes them a lot safer. And in the case of saffron, it also seems to be pretty mild. But the interesting thing is, you get this NMDA antagonism, you get this GABAergic effect, and then it's being backed up by increases in dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, which also produce mood-boosting effects and energizing effects. And this is probably where some of that energizing effect comes from. Now, some of the other compounds in saffron also appear to inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. So this means that it is causing an even more significant rise in serotonin. But also really interesting, and this is a little bit debated still, is how saffron is increasing dopamine and norepinephrine levels besides just acting like monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And some studies seem to indicate that perhaps the compounds in saffron inhibit the reuptake of dopamine while also inhibiting the reuptake of norepinephrine. Maybe this is the case. There's another study that's indicating that potentially, and I think, honestly, based on the effects that I'm experiencing, this is maybe a little bit more likely, because I do have quite a bit of experience with dopamine reuptake inhibitors like Subroxy, or norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like Ginkgo, and this doesn't really feel like that. I have had experience, very briefly, with a 5-HT2C serotonin antagonist. So this is a specific serotonin receptor. And I found a study that seemed to indicate that potentially some of the compounds in saffron might be able to inhibit this 5-HT2C receptor. This is really interesting because when 5-HT2C is activated, dopamine and norepinephrine are inhibited. So if you block 5-HT2C, you actually get increases, very significant increases in dopamine output and norepinephrine output. So if some of the compounds in saffron are inhibiting 5-HT2C, then we would see these increases in dopamine and norepinephrine. But because we're not entirely sure, there's this debate. Is it because saffron is acting as a triple reuptake inhibitor, meaning 
it's inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, or is it acting like a monoamine oxidase A and B inhibitor at a low level, which increases all three of those, then a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and then this 5-HT2C antagonist effect, which is then causing the increase in dopamine and norepinephrine. And this seems a little bit more likely to me, but it's my judgment is also maybe a little bit clouded because I haven't really come across a natural 5-HT2C antagonist and this is really exciting to me so I'm hoping this is the case so I'm biased here Um, so take that into account it could be either or I'm leaning towards the 5-HT2C but this is a really interesting effects profile then you get this NMDA antagonism you get this GABA agonism you get increases in serotonin dopamine and norepinephrine which really if you bring all of those together makes sense what we are feeling right now it gets a little bit more interesting though when we are stressed well actually when we are stressed we also experience an increase in 5-HT2C receptor expression which then inhibits dopamine and norepinephrine. So this is a part of why stress can be bad for cognitive function and mood. So it seems like saffron has a positive effect on stress too, potentially through 5-HT2C, but there's another thing called pituitary adenylate cyclase activating polypeptide. That's quite a mouthful, so let's abbreviate that to P-A-C-A-P, PACAP. So when we are stressed, PACAP levels drop. And PACAP is important for BDNF and neuroplasticity. So when we're stressed, neuroplasticity goes down, especially in the hippocampus. You see even atrophies there sometimes when people are chronically stressed for long periods of time. And this is likely, well, one of the reasons is likely because of this decrease in PACAP. Now, some of the compounds in saffron seem to actually enhance the expression of PACAP and can restore some of this lost neuroplasticity, and by that can have a very unique anti-stress effect. So that's really unique, and especially unique when you combine it with all of the neurotransmitter effects it has. And it just, when you start adding everything up together, it becomes really clear just why saffron is so mood boosting and why it has been used for its mood boosting properties for thousands of years. Very cool. So now we've covered kind of the beginning of the day, the energy and mood benefits of saffron. So now as we move into perhaps midday or things are starting to get a little bit more stressful, our um, cortisol levels are going to be at their highest point, maybe mid-morning, almost to afternoon. So now let's talk about neuroprotection and let's talk about the benefits that saffron has for pain processing. Yes, so with this PACAP effect, because you're enhancing neuroplasticity, when you're enhancing neuroplasticity, it usually also means you have a neuroprotective effect. And this is definitely causing a neuroprotective effect. But in addition to that, as we alluded to a little bit earlier, is that the crocins, the crocetin, saffronel, picrocrocetin, they are very good at regulating both inflammation and oxidation. And these are two factors that play a very big role in cognitive health, just brain health in general. And when we can dampen those, we can dampen neuroinflammation and neurooxidation, we can have a neuroprotective effect. And because these compounds can come into the central nervous system, they have these protective effects there. In addition to these neuroplasticity enhancing effect and neurotransmitter balancing effects it becomes a really nice balance of effects mood boosting and neuroprotection and then actually also cognition enhancing so one of the things when you enhance dopamine there's more executive function it's easier to get motivated to do things it's easier to stay focused on things it's also easier to task switch similar Serotonin, just having that mood boost, also makes it a little bit more likely that you will want to sit down and uh, research things or study for something. And combining it with the neuroplasticity effects also makes it more likely that you might encode this. Really interesting too is, and this was something that was being discussed in the earlier days of nootropics, was HDAC inhibitors. 
specifically HDAC1 inhibitors, which when you inhibit HDAC, you can have a, a nootropic effect. And there's not a whole lot of natural... There are some natural HDAC inhibitors, but they don't seem to be very potent. But saffron seems to have a fairly potent HDAC1 inhibition effect. And this can also have nootropic effects. So we have this mood boosting effect, neuroprotective effect, and then a nootropic effect. So in terms of brain health and overall cognitive function, this is a really, really interesting spice or planned botanical, however we want to call it. And moving on from there, in our, uh, not the previous podcast, two podcasts ago, we talked about pain. And pain has a lot of neurological origins too. And saffron seems to help with this. So, of course, pain is inflammation and oxidation based. And saffron can help with this. But saffron also hits the neurological targets of pain. One of these is NMDA. So when you inhibit NMDA receptors, you can have a nice pain management effect too. And we talked about this in the podcast about pain. And saffron produces this effect too. More interestingly though, you also have this GABAergic effects which can relax your muscles with the potent inflammation regulating effect, the NMDA effect. Uh, it creates a really unique pain management effect, both for inflammation-based pain and maybe some more neurological-based pain. So in my opinion, this is something that gets glossed over a lot with saffron, and it took me a while to realize just how potent of an effect it is, but I think for pain management, this is a really unique supplement. Awesome. So we have our beginning of the day, then we're moving on to sort of the middle of the day talking about neuroprotection and pain management. And now as we move further into the day, um, thinking about getting ready for rest or sleep, we talked a little bit earlier about how saffron can benefit sleep, but not in detail. So I'm curious to know what those pathways are that saffron is improving our sleep and our quality of sleep. So this is likely coming mainly from the GABAergic and serotonergic effects. GABA disinhibits parts of the brain, so it has a calming effect, but it really has a calming effect on our nerves, which makes it easier to fall asleep. So a lot of things that help with sleep are GABAergic, for example, lemon balm. And in our sleep support stack, for example, I spent a lot of time and attention developing the GABAergic portion to kind of slow your brain down a little bit. And saffron does this too. But we were also talking earlier about the energizing effects, and it's not necessarily a wakefulness stimulating effect. It's more you just feel a little bit lighter on your feet and you feel a little bit energized because of this. But traditionally, saffron was actually used for enhancing sleep and making it easier to fall asleep. And with the serotonergic effects in mind, this makes a lot of sense because if you are increasing serotonin levels, then you are also increasing melatonin levels because melatonin is synthesized from serotonin. So you need serotonin for melatonin production. You have more serotonin production because of saffron, or not necessarily production, but you have more serotonin staying around because it's not being taken back up as readily or degraded by the monoamine oxidase enzymes. You have more serotonin, the serotonin can turn into more melatonin and that can help enhance sleep. 5-HT2C antagonism could potentially also help with sleep, and this has been explored in some research recently. So I think if you look at the total picture of what saffron is doing, just helping to slow down brain activity a little bit, if you have a bit of an overactive mind, or you've had a stressful day, or you just have some racing thoughts and you can't get to bed, something like saffron could really help. And this is... uh, not necessarily going to make your sleep deeper per se, but it will maybe make it easier to fall asleep and stay asleep. Awesome. So 
now I'm already starting to think about potential stacks for saffron and specifically related to its sleep benefits, but we'll save that for a little bit later because there are some more general benefits to talk about here. One thing that we mentioned earlier in the podcast is the cardiovascular benefits and the respiratory benefits from saffron, and I'm curious to know what those pathways are. Yeah, those are mostly coming from the oxidation and inflammation balancing of legs. And oxid increased levels of oxidation and inflammation in our cardiovascular system is generally quite a bad thing. So when you add in compounds that can balance this oxidation and inflammation, usually this has a beneficial effect on the cardiovascular system. And research into saffron has actually proven that yes, saffron has a beneficial effect on our cardiovascular system, and the majority of this is coming through its oxidation and inflammation balancing effects. So for example, LDL, low density um, cholesterol, the what we like to call bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol actually by itself is not that bad. It gets bad when it's oxidized. So if you have things around that can help prevent the oxidization of LDL cholesterol, then you have uh, a beneficial effect on the cardiovascular system. And saffron does seem to do this. It seems to prevent the oxidation of LDL cholesterol. So that's really good. Another thing it does is it actually helps relax the blood vessels. And it does this through two separate pathways, it seems. One of them is by inhibiting calcium channels. And by doing this, it can help the blood vessels relax a little bit. Another thing it seems to do is it increases the bioavailability of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a compound that causes vasodilation. So the more bioavailable the nitric oxide is, the more it can be utilized, the more our blood vessels can relax, and the easier of a time blood will have pumping around our body. So this is really good general effects for the cardiovascular system, and it makes sense why saffron was used for cardiovascular benefits in traditional use. The oxidation and inflammation balancing effects, of course, also plays into the pain management effects, but it also has an effect on our vision. So as we talked about earlier, saffron is often used for vision as well. And this makes sense, of course, because of the origin of the compounds in saffron coming from zeaxanthin and beta carotene which classically are known to help enhance visual health eye health and the compounds in saffron seem to do this too but there's one way it's doing this is through regulating oxidation and inflammation but another way it's doing it is by limiting the negative effects of atp and This seems maybe a little bit odd because usually we talk about enhancing ATP levels because it's our cellular energy and we need ATP to drive every single process in our body. However, in the eyes, high amounts of ATP can cause cellular damage and partially because ATP can act on a receptor called P2X7. And when ATP activates this P2X7 receptor, you see damage to visual cells. And one of the compounds, I'm I'm a little bit unclear on which one it is actually at the moment right now, but one of the compounds in saffron can inhibit this P2X7 receptor. And by doing that, it can prevent the damage of high levels of ATP in the eyes. So that's good. Another thing it seems to do, and this is likely because of its cardiovascular effects, it can drop the ocular pressure. So our eyes also experience different pressure levels and the higher the pressure in our eyes, the worse our eye health usually is. So if we can reverse some of this excess pressure in the eye, our eye health should be better and our vision should be better. And saffron appears to do this likely through its blood vessel relaxing effects. So couple this with very prominent oxidation and inflammation regulating effects even in the eyes and then this p2x7 inhibition effect and um, reducing pressure in the eye it's quite clear why this is again a very revered herb for vision very cool so one thing that we haven't discussed yet is the benefits of saffron on the respiratory system 
Yeah, and this is mostly coming through the inflammation regulating effects. And also a little bit likely because of the uh, blood vessel relaxing effects. So this can maybe cause a bronchodilatory effect. And in some research, it does seem like saffron might have this bronchodilatory effect, which means that you can probably breathe a little bit easier. I do have to say, whenever I take something that has pronounced bronchodilatory effects, I can really notice it. So if I take a deep breath in, and let's try this. It doesn't really seem like it's any easier. What about you? Mm, I don't know, maybe a bit. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure how big of a role that necessarily plays. When I have taken things that have pronounced bronchodilatory effects, it usually feels like I can breathe deeper if I take a deep breath. I'm not experiencing that necessarily here. But one of the main star effects likely for respiratory health is just the inflammation balancing effect and balancing some of the oxidation in the lungs too. So this is good. Um, one other effect we haven't really touched on yet, but this is a, another traditional effect that actually has aphrodisiac libido enhancing effects. This is somewhat odd because of its serotonergic effects. You would sometimes expect the opposite to happen with uh, something that inhibits serotonin reuptake. But it doesn't seem to happen with saffron. And instead, it seems to have a libido enhancing effect. And it's traditionally used for this too. And the research is, I think, a little bit inconclusive. But from anecdotal responses that I've seen, it, it does seem to have a mild aphrodisiac effect, which is quite interesting. Absolutely. And I'm sure that there is also some similarities or perhaps compounding benefits from the the mood boost that you get from saffron as well in terms of how it's benefiting libido too. Absolutely. And this is likely, depending on how um, significant the dopamine enhancing effects are, this is likely where a lot of the libido boosting properties are coming from because increased levels of dopamine seem to oftentimes have an aphrodisiac effect and a lot of aphrodisiacs especially the ones from brazil that we're going to be getting into in the near future those all seem to have very prominent dopaminergic effects and through those dopaminergic effects have libido enhancing effects so i i'm guessing especially if the 5-HT2C antagonism effect holds true, I would say this is probably where some of the libido enhancing effects are coming from because this is disinhibiting dopamine, so it's causing dopamine release. Okay, so now that we're in this libido land, this is kind of leading me to wonder what effects does saffron, sorry, what effects does saffron have on hormonal profiles for men and women? And does it have a stronger effect on perhaps testosterone or estrogen or neither of these things? Neither. Yeah, it doesn't really seem to have many hormonal effects, actually. Okay, that's good to know. I was going to say, after this really, really long list of benefits, I almost expect it to be beneficial for every single system in the body. Um, but that is something that is good to know and keeping in mind if you are taking a hormonal balancing stack or you're you know, combining Tongata Lee or Sustanch, like some of these products we've talked about in the past, um, that saffron won't necessarily be interacting uh, hormonally with those other products. So this could be a really great uh, product to add to that stack more for the mood boosting and neuroprotective and cardiovascular benefits, but it's not going to get in the way of any of those other effects that you might be experiencing. Absolutely. One thing to keep in mind, though, is because it has quite prominent oxidation and inflammation balancing effect, it can actually protect some of the cells that make hormones. So maybe through this mechanism, it can enhance hormonal profiles a little bit, but it's not like Tangadali or Sistanj actually speeding up testosterone production or like horny goatweed increasing um, estrogenic effects or anything like that. It seems to be pretty neutral on the hormonal spectrum. I see. And it's not having a direct effect at all. That's yeah. good to know. So aside from all of these benefits that we just discussed, is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you came across in your research as far as health benefits for saffron? I think this is a 
pretty extensive list. I would agree. Absolutely. A very long and very detailed list for sure. And, so, and I really do think the, the star effect of Saffron is its mood boosting property. And from what I can tell now and doing a little bit more research, the pain management effects really seem to stand out. I haven't taken Saffron for a longer period of time, so I can't really comment on maybe the long-term effects on vision, but I have heard from some people that they might experience a little bit crisper vision, so that would be an interesting longer-term effect to look at, and because there are not a whole lot of things that have a very significant effect on vision, I would say this is definitely a star effect too. The cardiovascular benefits definitely are there too. So when you really look at it, I guess there aren't really any star effects, even though I would like to imagine that the mood boosting properties are the star effect because you can feel them the most. A lot of these other effects you can't necessarily feel acutely, but in the research, it seems to be quite a significant effect. So this really is a very versatile supplement. I'm coming to realize this as I'm doing this podcast too. I think I had a bit of a myopic view of what Saffron did. I just saw it as a mood booster and not a whole lot else until this point. Now looking into it a little bit more, it seems like a really great addition to a daily stack and I'm actually going to add it to my daily stack now. Very cool. I feel the same way. I would love to have this kind of sunshiny, um, lifted, mood boosting effect to my stack on a daily basis. So we can uh, report back in the future on conversations on Reddit, perhaps. Um, For those of you who aren't familiar or who aren't on Reddit yet, you can find all kinds of amazing conversations, questions, and discussions about supplements, botanicals, and neuroscience on our subreddit. That's r slash nootropics depot. So before we conclude the podcast, I want to get into a conversation about stacks and about other products that would fit well with saffron. So considering that saffron has these really great perceptible mood benefits, um, let's start there. What are some other products that would help kind of round out the mood boosting effects of saffron? Well, actually, I think maca. So we've mentioned maca a few times in this podcast and partially because our previous podcast before this one was about maca. But I really do think that when you take saffron together with maca, the effects become even more pronounced. And some of those libido boosting effects from saffron are very distinct from the libido boosting effects of maca. So they complement each other and they can become a little bit stronger. Maca also has this uh, very bubbly, almost giggly kind of effect too, I think through part of the endocannabinoid effect. So when you stack that together with saffron, you get a very nice complementary effects profile. So for something, if you're looking for enhancing energy levels, for boosting mood, and for enhancing libido, I think stacking saffron and maca together will be a very nice stack. Awesome. So for a good time, consider saffron plus maca. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So are there any other mood boosting supplements that you would want to add to that combination or perhaps a different combination that would have maybe more of a calming effect overall? Yeah, so for the maca and saffron, I would honestly keep that one quite simple because both have very extensive pharmacological effects and they don't overlap a whole lot. So when you combine them, you get a really big effect. Uh, pharmacological effects profile and synergy and synergy so that's really good but with that in mind adding other stuff to it like i'm thinking if i was going to add something to it i might want to add in an nmda receptor antagonist like magnesium or polygala but saffron is already doing that so you don't really need it and keeping it more simple sometimes is actually the the better way to go you don't always have to go for a huge stack. So I think maca and saffron together for mood, energy, libido, perfect. If we're going more for the calming effects, I do honestly think combining saffron with lemon balm, especially at night, would make for a really nice stack, 
especially one that's a little bit more catered towards falling asleep. So for the calming stack, I would definitely go for lemon balm and saffron together. That would be really nice. Nice. That gave me an idea that perhaps saffron and ashwagandha could be a good combination for daytime, for uh, stress management, and also the calming effects overall. Yeah, actually, that that's a really good idea as well for a calming stress resilience stack. I think that's good. And ashwagandha does have some effects on libido as well and some effects on hormonal profiles. So taking those two together would actually be a really great stack more for the daytime, really give you this defense against stress than for the nighttime having more of a lemon balm saffron combination to really enhance the calming aspects and the sleep promoting aspects and actually now that we're talking about this saffron would stack quite well with red rishi nine percent too that we talked about our ultra potent new rishi extract because rishi the ganoderic acids in rishi help enhance sleep and give this really nice natural calm feeling stack that together with saffron and i think you get a very nice i haven't combined them yet but i can imagine stacking those together would have a very nice complementary effect on each other and perhaps a little bit more subtle too than even adding lemon balm or ashwagandha absolutely but i do think having those let's say four stacks so the more morning energy libido stack being maca and saffron the more nighttime calming stack being lemon balm and saffron if you want something very potent and noticeable or swapping the lemon balm out for reishi if you want something a little bit more mild and natural feeling and then having ashwagandha yes and saffron for the daytime stress reliever yes that would be i think some really good mood-based simple stacks now if we move into the pain effects i can't actually imagine and this would be for mood a little bit too still well a lot still actually combining saffron with a tablet of kava the kava has a pretty pronounced muscle relaxant effect and has really good inflammation regulating effects too and has in my opinion one of the better pain management supplements so combining saffron with the kava would result in a quite a potent uh, pain management and mood boosting stack too. But if we want to keep it a little bit more neutral, we could also stack, for example, saffron and matrine. That would be a really unique stack for pain. It would kind of enhance the NMDA antagonist effects a little bit too. Um, another one could be saffron and andrographis or saffron and refl. That might actually be a really nice stack. Uh, refl providing a little bit more inflammation balancing effects, but also some endocannabinoid effects. If you go a little bit further, maybe even for longer term pain management effects, stacking PEA, palmitoyl ethanolamide and saffron together would be really nice especially because enhancing serotonin levels can help with nerve-related pain sometimes too. And PA is kind of specialized for dealing with nerve-related pain. So stacking those two together would be really nice too. Very cool. Okay, so beyond mood and pain management, we can also talk a little bit about the cardiovascular benefits. So what are some products that would stack well with saffron for cardiovascular benefits as i'm saying it out loud i'm thinking about fish oil that's the first thing that comes to mind yeah so our high epa of alum would be fantastic stack together with saffron for cardiovascular benefits because epa is really good for your cardiovascular system so that would be a great stack or what about saffron and omega tau yeah so omega tau is higher in dha so you're not going to necessarily get the epa benefits but dha is also very important for cardiovascular function just not as important as epa okay but i think if you are looking for a really nice well-rounded stack where you enhance the mood boosting properties of omega tau a little bit more and then also take advantage of some of the cardiovascular benefits of THA, then this could indeed be a nice stack. One of the first things that popped into my head, though, for a cardiovascular stack would be 
um, ubiquinol, and we have this in a soft gel called CoQHCF. Ubiquinol has also some unique effects on preventing the oxidization of LDL and balancing the LDL and HDL cholesterol levels with each other, and uh, ubiquinol is very famous for its cardiovascular benefits, so I think stacking those two together would be really nice too. And then if you wanted to add a little bit more blood flow to it, say for example you're going to the gym and you want to get that pump, uh, you want maybe a little bit more on the nitric oxide side. So as we mentioned earlier, saffron enhances the bioavailability of nitric oxide, makes it so that less nitric oxide can have a more significant uh, vasodilation effect. So if you stack it with something that enhances nitric oxide levels like citrulline malate, um, arginine, um, or even agmatine, you could have a very nice blood flow enhancement effect, which would be good for cardiovascular benefits, but would actually also be really good for going to the gym. Very cool. I didn't expect that saffron would take that turn, but here we are. Yeah, and actually it does seem the the effect, why it's causing this effect is not entirely known, but in older individuals with weaker muscles, saffron actually seems to help them regain a little bit of strength. And they did study saffron in certain athletes, and they found that giving saffron to men increased their enjoyment of physical exercise. But interestingly enough, they didn't find this effect for women. So hmm. maybe this is a male-specific effect, or maybe their sample size was just too low and they didn't have enough women in the study and they just had more men. Good to know. So we've gone through quite a lot of stack suggestions that you could combine with saffron. Are there any other combinations or ideas that you have that would be an extra special benefit to stack on top of all of the things that saffron has to offer? Yeah, so I think the vision benefits. We, oh, we can yes. have a stack there too. Uh, N-acetylcysteine also seems to enhance visual acuity, and I think stacking N-acetylcysteine with saffron would have far-ranging benefits on oxidation and inflammation, but since they both work on the vision system too, I think this is a great stack for eye health. So N-acetylcysteine and saffron. Awesome. I think other than that, I mean, I could honestly keep going with saffron because Always. it's <laughs> so versatile and it has so many different effects and it can have so many complementary effects with different things that you could definitely work up a lot of stacks with it. And I would encourage everyone to develop some simple stacks with saffron even though by itself it's almost a stack in itself because of all of the effects it has but you can really tease out some effects so you want a little bit more calming add some lemon balm you want a little bit more stimulation and focus add some subroxy uh, you want a little bit more stress relief add shodan you want a little bit more stress relief and energy, add Panax ginseng or rhodiola rosea instead, or even a salidrosol tablet. So you can really take those baseline effects of saffron and tease out different aspects of it with different supplements. Totally. So I think this has given everyone, and myself included, a lot of different ideas when it comes to how to move forward with saffron. And I certainly am going to be including the saffron extract into my daily stack for the next while, at least a few weeks, because I really like the benefits. And now that we're here uh, at the end of the podcast, I can certainly say that I feel calm and I feel clear headed. And actually, now that you're going over the benefits and I'm looking around me, maybe this is a bit placebo because we've been talking about the vision effects, but it does honestly seem like my vision is a little bit crisper and it seems like some of the colors are popping a little bit more. I would agree. Yeah, I, I actually have a similar experience. It's quite subtle, but it definitely is there for sure. Mm -hmm. And one of our colleagues, he's a really serious gamer and he's always looking for things that can enhance his visual acuity and he's always been interested in saffron for this reason. And... Now that I'm 
really paying attention to this effect. I could imagine maybe if you are like a competitive esports gamer person, uh, you do Counter Strike or something, you really need that fast visual acuity then this could be a really interesting supplement to take, especially because it enhances mood and focus and overall cognition, which is also important there. Or let's say you're a photographer and you're doing some very detailed editing work, or maybe you're a scientist and you're looking at very specific uh, slides and examples of cells or you know tissue cultures or something like that. There's all kinds of reasons why you might look for these specific vision benefits from saffron. Absolutely. Very cool. So I hope this uh, has given you a little bit more of an open idea of all of the different benefits that saffron might have for your health and your vision, your mood, and your uh, cardiovascular system as well. Saffron is one of the world's most expensive spices, and it makes sense because of all of the time and effort that goes into growing and processing and drying and ultimately using and benefiting from saffron. So it's worth the cost when you really consider all of its many benefits. This brings us to the end of this month's podcast. And this is actually an exciting podcast because this is number 12. Uh, We have been on this journey in search of insight with you for an entire year now. So it's a worthy time to celebrate. Thank you so much for listening and for sharing the In Search of Insight podcast with your friends. You can always ask us questions about what we chatted about on the podcast on Reddit. Our subreddit is r slash Nootropics Depot. And also get into conversations in the YouTube comments as well. We have chapters for those of you who want to go back and listen to specific sections, and we hope that you have found some precious and new knowledge in this podcast. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, we'll say bye-bye. See ya.